Greetings, I'm Barrent, and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. Today, we're going to be going through the game Reichbusters. Now, Reichbusters is by Mythic Games. This game is set in 1944. It's going to be against the Nazis. So sometimes the theme of these kind of games don't stick with everybody, but I do still want to bring this to you. I'm pretty excited to show you this game. This is the gung-ho pledge from the last Kickstarter. This game was given to me by Mythic Games to do a playthrough for you, so I just want you to be aware of that. In this video, we're going to go ahead and set the game up. We're also going to meet our characters, and then we're going to find out what mission we're going to be going through. If you're excited to see how Reichbusters plays, then I need you to meet me at the co-op shop. Now, the mission book for Reichbusters comes with two different ways of playing the game. One is it does have an expansive scenario that you can go through, starting with mission one and continuing all the way through to mission six. Now, that's one way to play the game, to start here on mission one and continue on. But we're not going to play it that way because there are already playthroughs like this. I just really want to show you how this game fully plays with everything going on. So we're actually going to flip to the back. And in the back, they have the raid setups these are one-off scenarios that you can play that go out ahead on a huge map and they actually can encompass four of our reich busters and it kind of powers them up a little bit as if you were to play through the scenario itself to give you a fighting chance against all the enemies they're going to be throwing at you so we're going to go ahead and try one of these raids so let's go ahead and get that set up so the first thing we need to do when setting up our raid is choose our map so there's four different maps to choose from. I'm just going to go ahead and take map time. This is going to be our map layout. And these letters and numbers are going to correspond with the tiles. And also these are going to possibly be objective markers for maybe some of our objectives we're going to be doing. We're going to go ahead and put that there. Next, we're going to go ahead and pick a raid faction. Now there's four of these factions. There's the Vril Overlord, the Wolf Hunts. We're just going to go ahead and take the Vril Experiment. Now these are going to represent all the different monsters and enemies that could come out during our gameplay. We're going to go ahead and put that there. Next, we have to pick a mission. There again are four raid missions. We have assassinate, scheduled demo for demolition, find the dossier, and misinformation. We're just going to take assassination. We're going to go on an assassination here. And it says right down here, Reichbusters HQ has discovered that the secret Nazi research facility is under the command of a brilliant yet evil Vrilmeister. The death of this individual would cripple the projects. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So here's going to be an extra setup for our raid. It says place the Vrilmeister and their detail at X. Make the room suspicious. And when the Vrilmeister is removed from play, place the four objective. Complete items face down in the area. A hero can, who can draw a line of sight to this area gains an objective complete item. All right, that's awesome. So basically we have to go in and defeat this person. A hero must escape the map with the objective complete item. All right. We're going to put that right there. That's going to be our mission. And the last thing we have to do is we have to pick a team. That's right. There's many different teams that could go in on this mission. And you guessed it. There's four. It seems to be a common number. Four. There's four different teams. And these teams are going to give bonuses to your, to your four characters you choose depending on which one you choose. You may gain maybe some items and some extra abilities here and some heroic points, which are going to be like basically they can cancel it kind of can cancel the dice and give you successes that way. Um, I'll explain it as we actually play through the game. For example, this one gives us a lot of extra stuff in here. This one gives us some stuff and things like that. But I think we're going to take this one, this Team Kestrel. This is going to give us four extra permanent abilities for our characters. And it gives us six of these, what is it, heroic points, which are going to help us. And on top of that, it gives us a boost when using heroic points. And I'll go over some of that as we're playing through the game. So that's going to be our raid setup. We're going to get our map ready, and we're going to continue on. Now, I've gone ahead and set up all the map tiles just like it shows inside this mission book. Of course, it's facing this way. I can't put it this way because the map doesn't actually encompass it this way. I've got to set it up this way. So our thing is set up this way. These are all the tiles. Now, some things I want to point out, as you're going to see out on this map, is there are exits, and there are some entrances. So here's our entrance. It's going to be right over here. It's kind of off camera. But other things I want to show you are these down here. There's an a, a B, and a C with these helmets. These are going to be potentially how some of the 
enemies are going to be coming onto the board once we get too loud. This game has this really interesting stealth mechanic, and your goal is obviously to be as stealthy as you can for as long as you can, and once the alarm sounds, that's when everything starts going to chaos. It's absolutely fun to see how this game evolves as you play through it. Now, the other things I'm going to put down now are the doors and some of these other tokens that you're going to see out on the board, and I'll explain some of those once they're down. So the next thing I did is I put out all of our little tokens. These are some of the things we're going to be able to search for as we're playing through the game. Now this particular symbol is going to result in gaining something similar to what could be on this thing. So some type of military equipment or weaponry of some kind. And this number right here is how much noise it takes to look for this inside the room. So you're going to see how that works as well. For example, here's another one. This is some kind of box. There's something in there. We don't know what it is. And there's a, those are about the only things out there. There's a couple other ones. There's potential medical equipment inside some of these. There are also some drill components inside some of these. And all of these, if you notice, does take two sound, uh, noise in order to search for it. So those are put out all over the board. Uh, and there's also these tokens as well. These are guard points. If an enemy is on these guard points, they may gain bonuses or they may have to stay there and guard this position without having to come after us. So those are examples of how that's going to be used. And you'll see how that works in the playthrough. Next, we're going to go ahead and set up our spawn tokens. So now I've gone ahead and set up our enemy tokens. These are denoted by a 1, a 2, and a 3. They're not spawn tokens, they're enemy tokens. These enemy tokens are going to show what type of enemies are going to be on the map when they're revealed based on a card draw and you're consulting a table. Again, we'll see how that goes during the playthrough. So our enemy tokens are placed out there. The next thing we're going to put out there are going to be our doors. And I waited to kind of put those out there because they're going to take up the majority of the map. And I wanted to show you kind of how the whole map lays out before I put them down. So we've gone ahead and placed all the doors. As you can tell, they do kind of take up a little bit of the, of the board. Now, I do want to talk about the doors a little bit. Each door has its own level of noise it's going to make when it opens, that you're trying to open the door. This one, for example, is a 1. The reason I know this is because of this symbol, this light up here. There's one light up here to show me that that's how much noise it's going to make. So if I tried to open this door, I'd be rolling for noise with three because there's three lights. It's the way they made the game so that you can denote which door is doing what in the game. Normally, it comes with these little cardboard door symbols that have a number that show you. These don't have the numbers. These just are going to show you by the number of lights that are on this door. This door, for example, is a three, even though it's absolutely huge. And check this door out. All these doors actually open. So this door will open to know that you can go on through, that you've opened the door and you're able to go through this door. All the doors do this. These swing open and close. This is really cool. I'm really, I really dig these doors instead of just opening them. And actually, the opening of the door is actually a mechanic in the game that you're going to see happening. So it is important that those doors actually did open. Now that we have the entire map set up and ready to go, we are going to look at our mission really quick. It has some extra setup instructions. It does say, place the Vrillmeister and their detail at X. Make the room suspicious. When the Vrillmeister is removed from play, place the four objective complete items face up in their area. A hero who can draw line of sight to these areas gain an objective complete item. So we're going to put her in X. X is located right here according to our map. So here is the miniature for the Vrillmeister. She's going to go out here into X, and our room, they said, is going to be suspicious. That, of course, is the way some of the noise mechanics works. For now, I'm just going to put this token here, and I will explain this as we start the playthrough. But just know this room's suspicious once we start going in that direction. With our map completely set up, let's go meet our characters that are going to be part of the Reichbuster team. Our first Reichbuster we're going to meet is Red Hawk. Red Hawk is built to be able to kill the enemy in close combat when needed, but obviously excels at range where her accurate sniper rifle can pick out key targets and enemies before they become a problem. With her powerful feats, Red Hawk really wants to draw a line of sight to the biggest threat on the table and eliminate it with extreme prejudice. So we're going to put her right here, and this is going to be Red Hawk's starting equipment. The first thing she has is her focused ability. This allows her to reroll a die in combat. Next, she's got her accurate sniper rifle, which she can shoot pretty much right down the board. She doesn't really have a line of sight issue. She has six range with this. It rolls three dice, but it does cause two noise, and we'll see how all that plays out during our playthrough. And of course, she has her knife here. That's precise, which means if you do roll a miss, you can at least gain one hit out of it. It, of course, has no range because it's a knife, and it <laughs> has two attack dice, and it has zero noise when you stab somebody with it. So that's her. Now, of course, along with all those items, every character comes with a whole deck of cards that you're going to be using to play through this game. 
she's going to start with two what are called feet cards. They're going to have just one thing it does, and it's kind of more of a majorly big, powerful ability. And then they have all these other cards that you can use in different ways. You could either use the top part or you could use the bottom part, depending on what the situation is and what you need to do in the game. Some of these cards are also going to give you boosts. When you roll dice, be able to give you or other allies the ability to do more successes and hopefully take down enemies. So this is her deck of cards. We're going to go ahead and put that right here, and she's all set to go. Our next Reich Buster is Quinton. Quinton is a flexible character, able to fight at range or in close combat, move quickly and do it all quietly. Whilst he might never excel in one area, he always be useful in every turn of the game. Reliability is the key to Quinton with his precise weaponry, making sure the number always fall in his favor. Trust in Quinton and you'll be fine. So Quinton's going to go right here, and he also gets his horse starting equipment. Quinton gets a knife just like Red Hawk. It's exactly the same, but he also gets this bow, which has three range. It rolls two dice, and it doesn't do any da noise either, and it's precise. So if she ever rolls blanks, he at least gets one hit out of it. Also, he comes with stealthy. So whenever he's doing an action that is not an attack, he can re-roll one of his noise dice, which can really help out when you're trying to like open doors and things like that. Now, of course, Quentin gets his own set of cards. I didn't actually show those off while I was looking at his board, but it's the same thing. He gets the two trait cards, and then he gets the other cards as well that he's going to be using throughout the game. Next, we have our next Reichbruster here. Our next racer is going to be Claudine. Claudine's ability to generate movement thanks to her powerful vengeance skill makes her excellent at clearing rooms quietly. She'll often go through her whole deck two or three times in a game, but doing so allows her fellow teammates to reserve their own actions for their tougher enemies that Claudine might struggle with. So here's her card. We're going to put it there. And she gets, of course, the cards. I'm not going to forget to do them this time. I'll show them before each of the weapons. She gets a couple awesome skills. These are her trait cards. And then she also gets a whole bunch of cards. So she can give out some defense. She can give out some of these. She can cause people to move and she can, or sorry, she can move and draw a card. She can do some other things like play after you wound an enemy to make an attack. She gets to do like an extra wound. She can reroll blank results. She's got a lot of fun things she can do. Now she also has some awesome items. She, of course, has a knife. It seems like all oh my guys have knives. They all have knives here. <laughs> She's got a knife too. Why not? Everybody gets a knife. Now she also has a machine gun here that has two range. It causes three noise, so it's pretty noisy. And it actually does get to roll three dice. Now it does roll burst, which means it could have potentially hit a lot of different enemies in the same room. And like her card says, she comes with Vengeance. Vengeance allows her to move one square into an area where at least an enemy is that you can do a melee attack with. If you can't move into a place where an enemy is, you can't take advantage of the Vengeance card. But that's Claudine. We're going to meet our last Reichbuster. The last Reichbuster we're going to meet is Sarge. Sarge is loud when combat starts, but if he's firing his Thompson, it's already gone wrong. His real strength, it will always be his incredible action deck with numerous ways to move and support his team, pushing them forward to victory. Squad Leader makes him a perfect for being in the thick of things. So make sure to have a handful of cards when it's time to go. And of course, we're going to put him here, and let's go over the stuff he has. He has a, the same type of machine gun that we just saw with Claudine. It does three attack. It has three noise. And it actually has two range, but again, it can burst, so potentially hitting multiple targets. He also comes with his squad leader. Squad leader, this hero may play a single card from their own hand to modify an attack test of another hero in the same or adjacent area. So we're going to go ahead and put that here. That's his little power. And then he's got his gun, which has double tap and versatile. Double tap allows him to roll some extra dice if he gets lucky enough while he's rolling his attack dice. Now, it's only a range of one, and you can't actually fire weapons in melee range, except this one you can because it's versatile. It's allowed to be fired at range zero, so he can actually fire that in close combat. And just like the other characters, Sarge has his action deck with his two traits and all these other cards. And a lot of these are going to be helping boost other characters, giving them plus two to attack, some extra die results for defense and attack. He's also able to give out, he's also able to be the one that gets attacked. If that happens, he can actually take, and take people and, and allow them to attack him and instead of the people they're attacking. So we're going to go ahead, and that's the end of Sarge. Those are all of our 
Reichbusters. Now, these characters are ones from the base game. I'm not using any of the expansion material. In case you're interested in picking up at least just the base game, at least you see what you're going to be getting. But if you want to get all the extra expansions, there's more characters, more enemies, and different ways of playing the game. And some of the enemies actually play different from the ones that are in the base game. But we're going to be using base material for our characters. So these are our four guys. We're going to put them out on the board. So we're going to put our characters over here on the entrance. We have Sarge. He's right here. Now, sadly, I'm going to tell you right now, Sar these miniatures aren't painted. If you know anything about my playthroughs, I pride myself on having painted miniatures. If you see how this game is played, you're going to understand why I haven't had a chance to paint these miniatures. If I were to paint all the miniatures in this game to get ready to for this playthrough, I would probably be about 60 by the time I actually played the game. So we're going to go ahead and play it now because I really want to show you the game. So we got Sarge. We've also got the rest of our characters here. We got who's that? This is uh, this is Quinton. This is going to be Claudine, and this is going to be Red Hawk with her sniper rifle. So we're going to go ahead and put it down right here. These are our four guys. We start behind the door, of course. It's not open. Now that our characters are placed, I do want to talk about our team because we get some extra bonuses. All right, we're going to be Team Kestrel. No, we're not going to be Team Edward or Jacob. That's my Twilight reference, though. It's a pretty bad reference. All right, this is our guys. We are the Twilight Kestrel. It says, the cost of changing a field test to a success for Team Kestrel members is always one heroic point, regardless of whether it is done before or after the dice are rolled. So we're also going to gain these extra abilities, and we're going to be gaining some heroic points. I'm going to talk about those in just a second. The stars guide us. They do not bind us. Team Kestrel members are the most elite operatives the Reichbusters have to offer. Send them in when there is no room for failure. Well, hopefully we live up to our team <laughs> motto here. All right, so we get our heroic points. We get three of these, and we also get three of these. Now, what these can be used for, before the dice are rolled, I can go ahead and spend either an offensive or defensive heroic point to gain a success. That means the total, you don't have to roll any dice, your dice meet what you need to meet in order to have the success happen. Now, if you decide to do it after the dice are rolled, it will cost you two heroic points. But since we are Team Kestrel, according to this, we get our power. We can roll the dice and decide then, oh no, that's not what we want. We can then use one of our uh, was heroic points just to make the thing a success. I hope that makes sense. Now, let's continue on. Now, according to our Team Kestrel card, we get four extra abilities that I can divide amongst my characters. And each of these has a special ability. So we're going to start with Quick Shot. Quick Shot allows me, if I'm rolling the dice to attack and I manage to get this symbol, I could spend that symbol to make another attack after the action resolves. I think we're going to leave that to Red Hawk, since she'll be probably firing that sniper rifle quite a bit. Next, we have Counter. This allows us to, if, uh, during our defense, if we roll this symbol, we can go ahead and make an attack against the person that actually attacked us. I think we're going to give that to Claudine, because I'm guessing she might be getting right up and personal with a lot of different people. Next, we have Ironhide. Ironhide, we can spend this symbol to allow us to gain an extra couple dice while we are going to be defending. So I'm going to give this to Sarge. I'm hoping he can actually hold out. The last one we have is Lone Wolf. This states that at any time when you're by yourself and you get attacked, you gain one extra defense dice. So I'm going to go ahead and give that to Quinton. I don't know if it's ever going to come into effect. We'll find out. We'll see how this all works as we play. Hopefully some of these extra abilities are going to benefit our group. Let's continue on setting up the game. Next, we're going to go ahead and set up our enemies over here. And the w you can set this up however you want to. I usually set this up this way. So I'm going to get my faction card. I'm going to put that right here. So as I'm finding out what to spawn, I can just quickly come over here and reference it. Also, we have a stack of all of the enemies that you can find on this reference card. I put them kind of all up here. And be whatever ones I'm using, I kind of lay out into these areas. And of course, this is just a mat. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's all you can put them. So I can put them up higher. Just I can spread them out so that I have a chance to be able to read through all the different things because these characters are all going to be doing different things. They're going to be attacking differently and they're going to be defending differently. Now when we're playing this, we're going to be playing the real experiment. So I have to pull all the different cards that have that keyword in o out here because there could be different types of dogs. There could be this dog that's used for viral experiment and these and also these. Now there could be another dog in the enemy deck that could be used for a totally different set of missions and could have different stats or a different type of zombie. So when you're going and setting up the game, make sure you grab the right ones. So we're going to go ahead and put all of our enemy cards right up here so they're readily available for us. Now over here, I'm going to set up our round tracker. This is kind of what we're going to use to determine how far we are in the game, what happens to us. This is going to be in both silent and loud. This is pre-alarm, 
and this is post alarm. So it, they're and the way the monsters react and actually enter the board and attack us is going to be different based on the pre alarm and post alarm phases. We're also going to use this counter to show where we are. We start here on number one. And as we go through each turn, we're going to raise it one. And also, being in contact with enemies are also going to potentially raise this as well, along with some of the noise that happens in the game could raise this. And we have until we get to here. If we ever get to here and we haven't completed the objective, we have failed. Now, we're going to go ahead and get our spawn deck ready. And I'm just going to show you one of the spawns. So depending on what number you're spawning, it's going to have letters associated to it. And those are going to be the type of enemies when we reference our card that are going to be found whenever we get to one of these tokens. When I flip, when I go ahead and am able to draw a line of sight to this token, I'm going to be referencing this spawn card and then figuring it out based on the card over with our faction. So I'm going to mix these up. And we're going to go ahead and put them right over there in the spawn area right there. Next, we have our pre-alarm noise deck. We're going to mix this up. Now, these are going to there's going to be a set of things that happen on this card. One is the top part. This part happens no matter what when you roll noise and you actually make noise. This is a threshold number. If your noise value is higher than this, the bottom takes place as well. So we're going to mix these up and put them in the pre-alarm area right over here, and it's ready to go. Now, the next thing we're going to do is set up our post-alarm deck. Our post alarm deck is right here, and again, we're going to take a look at it. Again, if you roll noise during the post alarm session, you're going to have to deal with this. If you reach a threshold, this happens, which means that we're going to be spawning in these characters from the spawn card in these different barracks areas. And I showed you those on the board, the A, B, and C. Those are the barracks that these enemies are going to be coming in on. If you're in the post alarm era and you're not close to finishing the game, oh boy, you got big trouble. So we're going to mix these up a little bit and <laughs> we're going to put them right there. There we go. Next we have our wound deck. This is our wound deck. We're going to go ahead and look at one of those. Again, this is how the wound deck works. That's not a very good one. This one. So for example, we get wounded. We're going to have to if we didn't roll enough of our defense to prevent ourselves from being wounded, we would first start with this. Now, we weren't able to prevent wounds up to three. Say the guy hit us for seven and we only rolled a two on our defense dice. We would be over the threshold of three and we would have to take advantage of this. And we would also keep this as a permanent wound next to our character. If you ever have enough, too many permanent wounds, you're going to be downed and potentially captured by the enemies. And that would be tragic because then you're going to be out of the game. All right. Those decks are all set up. Now, one more thing we have to do is put out our locked doors. There are some doors out here that are locked, which means it's going to be even harder for us to get through these doors. So we're going to put these tokens up on top of those particular doors so that we know that these are locked. There's one here, one here, and there's also one right over here. Now, as we play through the game, as you can see, there's multiple ways to get to our final room right here. And you don't have to clear out all these enemies to get to this room. If you can sneak through maybe only one way in order to take her out, then you'd have probably be your best way of doing it. But of course, if the alarm ever sounds, all these guys are going to spawn and they're going to be charging at you as fast as they can. So you really want to get to stay as stealthy as you can for as long as you possibly can. Other than that, the only thing we have left are these are our player turn markers. And at the beginning, during our pre-alarm phase, we can choose the order of who we want to go. But once the alarm sounds, it's a mass chaos. You're going to shuffle these all up and draw them. And you're going to have to figure out, who you're not maybe have a good enough plan to figure out who's going to go when. Say you wanted Sarge to go. Oh no, Sarge is going at the end. That's too bad. So we're going to go ahead and put these next to our, our player board over there. But just remember during our pre-alarm, I'm going to be able to say who wants to go and when they go. But of course, you have to use all four characters each turn. And then you go to the next turn. You can't just use the same one over and over again. So we're going to pl place these next to our player boards. And that concludes our setup of Reichbusters. Now, as you can tell, there's a lot of setup that goes into a game like Reichbusters. It's a very dungeony crawler type experience where the setup is a really kind of a, a big time factor. So as you get this ready to go to the table, you might want to get it set up before everybody comes over to play. Now, this can be played one, two, three, or four players, and you can play with one, two, three, four or Reichbusters. I'm using four in this certain scenario, but and it is recommended to play with four. But they, you can play with one or two, but it may be a little bit more difficult because you're not going to have all the extra added bonuses that some of the other characters can help out with. So that's right, Busters. It's ready to go. I hope you're excited as well. This game is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to showing you all the mechanics that go along with Reich Busters. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell symbol so you know when the playthrough for Reich Busters starts. We're going to have a blast. Also, please feel free to leave anything in the comments below. I would love to hear from everyone. 
I do want to mention that at the time of this recording, they're just put out their FAQ. So I'm going to try to make sure I use some of the FAQ rules that they changed to that the community suggested while I try to do this playthrough. I may miss a few, and if I do, please let me know. Thank you so much for watching. And if you're excited to see if our right busters can take down the Brillmeister, then I need you to meet me at the co-op shop. Yeah,